Welcome to Oh God, What Now? New Year, New Danger. I'm Dorian Linsky. On today's show, citizens in countries whose populations add up to half the human race are eligible to cast a vote in the biggest election year in history. In our election section, we'll ask how many of them will really count. And like Fox News in America, the right-wing media in the UK is busy constructing its own little universe. What does this mean for the future of conservatism? Most of us are in the studio because, uh, it says in the Tory press, Sadiq Khan caved to his union paymasters and called off the tube strike like the socialist swine he is. Uh, let's meet them. Rachel Cunliffe is Associate Political Editor at The New Statesman. Hello, Rachel. Hello. I thought it was going to be remote, but no, I'm here. Thanks to the Union Paymasters. Yeah, <laughs> and sure. S- and Sadiq Khan. Khan's yeah. spineless caving. <laughs> um, Chris Skidmore, Tory MP for Kingswood, has resigned the Tory whip to protest the awarding of new oil and gas licences in Rishi Sunak's energy bill. Tories are spitting blood over it, of course. Is it unusual for an MP to resign the whip on a matter of principle as opposed to resigning a, a ministerial post? Well, it's it's more than just resigning the whip. He's also resigned as an MP. Resigning the whole thing, yeah. Um, and that's kind of interesting as well because, uh, yes, it is quite unusual for MPs to resign the whip, but Chris Skidmore has said already that he wasn't going to stand in the next election. Um, so, you know, as far as his career as an MP, it, it was going, like, he was, he was already checking out. Mm. But... He didn't have to resign as an MP. He could have just stood as an independent for the rest of the year. But he said he was quitting as an MP and that causes more trouble for the government because that means they have to have another by-election. We know there's going to be one in Wellingborough where Peter Bone is no longer the MP. Uh, There's going to be one in Blackpool South, Scott Benton and the gambling lobbying scandal. Uh, And now there's going to be one in Chris Skidmore's constituency too. And that is another by-election that the Conservatives really did not want to have to have and wouldn't have needed to have if he'd just resigned the whip. Um, And I've got his resignation letter here. And his letter says at the end, we should be taking the long-term decisions for the future of our country that protect our citizens, our economy and our planet, not playing Mm. short-term politics with legislation that achieves so little but does so much to destroy the reputation of the UK as a climate leader. And you're like, come on, Chris, tell us what you really think. Well, Tim Stanley uh, in The Telegraph wrote a piece going, Chris Skidmore sums up what's wrong with with Tory MPs. Unlike Scott Benton, the gambling shill, and Peter Bone, who uh, has been suspended over allegations of bullying and sexual misconduct. To to pick on Chris Skidmore (laughs) in that lot seems revealing. So I think the big thing for Conservatives was loyalty. Uh, and that, you know, whether you agreed with the leadership or not, like you you were loyal to the party. Mm-hmm. And there is a sense in the Conservative Party that what Chris Gidmore has done by triggering this by-election that didn't need to happen in a year when there's going to be an election anyway, that was very disloyal. Mm. Uh, and they're very upset at him for it. But yeah, you could also say if even people who are literal Conservative MPs are deserting you, do you think maybe the problem might be with you? Well, um, in other by-election news, Peter Bone's old seat of Wellingborough will be contested by Peter Bone's girlfriend, Helen Harrison. (laughs) Um, This does not seem like a great way to distance uh, the party from the scandal. Why has the local association done this? Well, I think you start with the the idea that there aren't that many people who want to devote the next like a couple of months of their life uh, to a campaign that they're almost certainly going to lose, that even if they won, they'd then lose in a general election later. But I love this particular back and forth as a whose fault it was because Rishi Sunak was was questioned about it and he said, well, that's up for the local association to pick their candidates or whatever. Uh, And then it turned out that CCHQ shortlisted the candidates uh, and so they chose to put uh, Peter Bone's girlfriend uh, on on that list and it's a bit of an odd selection anyway because I think his wife was there in the room to watch the girlfriend being selected as the candidate uh, and I think uh, we should all ask her, all of us journalists anytime we're reporting on this, I certainly will, what she thinks about him being suspended because I imagine you'd get quite an interesting answer. The idea that Peter Bone would be in the middle of this sort of political love triangle of all the MPs. I mean, that's not a sentence I really wanted to have in my head. <laughs> uh, Marie LeConte is a columnist and author of Haven't You Heard and Escape. Hello, Marie. Hello. Um, like me, you've been affected by the cyber attack that has paralysed the British Library since last October and has been weirdly underreported despite the fact that it, it, there's sort of no end in sight. Um, there's been a bit more coverage. What are we learning about it now? 
So very briefly, I just need to say bonanza, because uh, that is the thing I keep thinking about whenever I see the Peter Bone story, that, but that, that, no one has done it yet. something else that Sorry? I didn't need to have in my yeah, head. Yeah, that, uh, Peter's many bones. Boner, Peter, Peter Bone. bone. Yeah, that, yeah, 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 no, no, it's endless, it's endless. Uh, but no, no, actually, but back to the actual uh, serious story at hand. So uh, back in October, there was a ransomware attack against the British Library, um, and they asked for so just over £600,000 um, because they'd locked everything. So I think even uh, like in the first few weeks, uh, people working at the British Library could not even access their emails, let alone any book, which is kind of a problem for the library. Um, and then and, and the, the latest development is uh, that they found it's now going to cost them around £7 million to put everything back online, which is about 40% of its financial reserves, which is uh, quite mad, really. And it may take up to a year as well for everything to go back online. Returning to the show, Rafa Bear is a Guardian columnist, author of Politics, a Survivor's Guide, and host of the Politics on the Couch podcast. Hello, Raf. Hi there, Dorian. Uh, the ITV drama Mr. Bates versus the Post Office has made the Horizon Post Office scandal headline news 25 years after the first IT errors that led 700 sub-postmasters to be accused of fraud. Some went to jail, uh, some committed suicide. This comes after years of reporting by Panorama Private Eye and other outlets and amid an ongoing inquiry. So are you surprised that it took a TV drama to make the Prime Minister speak out? Because that's why a lot of people are saying, oh, nobody paid attention to this until it was on TV, which is not strictly true. If by surprised you mean depressed, yes. <laughs> I just, it, it is sort of emblematic of the way politi politics is conducted these days. I think that somehow it had to be quasi fictionalized in order for it to sort of register i think that probably there's also an element of it not being on the bbc somehow makes it easier for for the, the tories and conservative government to get agitated about it for it to be in the realm of of entertainment somehow almost glamorizes it in a way that makes it an issue that politicians want to latch onto also enough time has passed and there's the you know it, it started under the new Labour government. There was an issue of the coalition government. There was a, you know, the, a Liberal Democrat was was the relevant minister uh, at when some of the crucial decisions were being taken or rather not being taken. So there is a kind of time gives a certain permission uh, to to talk about it now. But no, ultimately, uh, it feels to me almost reprehensible that so late suddenly there is some political traction around this thing that people ought to have been incensed about for a lot longer so now we know that if you've got something you're concerned about you need to cast toby jones and then people <laughs> will pay attention um you mentioned there the lib dem who is ed davey who was the minister for postal affairs so this was very much in his uh, bailiwick uh he is now of course lib dem leader and because people would like a scapegoat that isn't the system um at the moment he's the lightning rod how how bad is that for him? It's pretty bad, I think, in a couple of ways. I mean, the main one being that, you know, even though he was leader of the Lib Dems and we're going into an election year, probably most people have never heard of him. Uh, you know, the, the, to be leader of the Liberal Democrats, the, the main challenge is generally getting noticed at all. Uh, and, Job done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and ideally, you would therefore, when you do get noticed, it is in your capacity as someone who's a sort of insurgent challenger, you know, neither Labour nor the Tories, repository for protest votes, all that sort of thing. So to be, to get your first big cut through of name recognition as oh, remember that time when the Lib Dems went into coalition and were completely spineless and basically went along with lots of awful things and no one really knew what they stood for. Yeah, them, well, they're back and he's the guy who's now leading them. That is not a good look. I think if I were being generous uh, to Ed Davey, I would, I would say, you know, actually he's guilty, it seems predominantly, of the same thing that almost everyone was guilty of at the time, which was simply thinking there's some kind of aura of respectability around the post office brand that means kind of surely they aren't being quite as appallingly wicked uh, and nasty and venal and corrupt and devious as as it turns out they were being. Um, uh, also, I think yeah, there is an extent to which ultimately you know, his defence is that you know, his advisors in the civil service were saying, look, you know, we've looked at this, there's nothing there. Uh, it's not a great defence that as a minister you go, oh, we'll go on then. But you know, ministers are busy, they do that sort of thing all the time. Ought he to have said, actually, no, I really want to know what's going on here and I'm going to take a stand? Yes, of, obviously, of course he should have done. He sort of said he should have done. 
that he didn't, you know, in the order of spinelessness and weakness and regrettable things to do. Where is it? It's pretty bad. I don't know how how sticky that will be on him. Another great honest. week for the honours system, of course. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> the head of the post office was uh, ennobled, was she? She got her CBE, CBE in, oh, right. in 2019, which is baffling to me because having watched the drama, the, the thing that st- stands out is just how long it went on for and people raised the alarm in like 2002, 2003. There were, the post office did its own inquiry. Uh, MPs were, she was questioned about it before MPs, select committees, the inquiry found them. What, like, all of these things happened and then in the midst of all these things happening... She then got a CBE anyway. And that's the mm. bit that I'm just like, hang on, did those two departments not talk to each other? To which the answer is probably no, they didn't. Do they not Google beforehand? No, <laughs> just but, but apparently, apparently like, not. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, it yeah. is fascinating how you know, one of the reasons this has taken so long to really cut through politically is that there's so much blame to go around and it doesn't really fall on a convenient left-right political axis. Mm. I mean, the Postmasters Union absolutely disgraced themselves by by essentially defending the post office because they were terrified of losing some of the, the accounts that Horizon, you know, the, the software uh, was involved in delivering uh, for the post office. It, the, the whole thing just, there's, there's so much complicity and complacency by so many people at every level of British public sector, private sector politics, that actually no one really had sufficient, consistent incentive to turn it into a massive political fight. It's a giant herd of scapegoats. <laughs> Pretty much. The US, India, Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Mexico, Russia and 16 African nations are among more than 60 countries holding elections this year. Uh, As you probably heard, that represents half the world's population, although a mere 2 billion will actually be uh, voting. Some of these elections will be more democratic than others. Don't hold your breath uh, for a shock defeat for Vladimir Putin. So where is there real possibility of change? And with new voter ID laws in the UK and Donald Trump sounding very much like a dictator in waiting, is democracy ailing in the West too? According to the Nobel Peace Prize winner Maria Ressa, we will know whether democracy lives or dies by the end of 2024. Oof. Um, Raf, that's a cheering start. Last week, you wrote in The Guardian about Britain in the US. Elections signify democracy. They also mask its decline. What is primarily worrying you? Well, the point I was making there really is that I think a lot of people find it easy to get attached to the idea that the, the core emblematic bit of democracy is the elections. People turn up, you vote, you choose a leader. uh, And if that happens and it's free and fair, then you kind of got democracy, which is obviously true. I mean, there's no democracy without elections, but you can also have elections masking a lot of corrosion and decline of democracy. And one of the fascinating and most challenging things, particularly about the, the prospect of Donald Trump staging a comeback in the US is that he could be freely and democratically elected and still be an authoritarian tyrant. And that election signifies some really quite profound collapse of the whole culture and ethos of democracy uh, in the US. And and particularly the, the very fact that he rejected the the outcome of the last election uh, and that his base his electoral base is you know consists of people who essentially think that he never lost that election and that would support him using the justice system and co-opting the rule of law to sort of vindictively punish democrats and anyone in the you know the Biden administration who tries to uphold law so that you know that's a sort of a terrifying thing that can happen to you know the largest democracy in the world while all the, all through it, there having been at least you know the continuance of the electoral process going quite normally. Well, I'm not a doomster by nature, um, so I'm not sure what to make of this piece that Robert Kagan wrote in the Washington Post about you know America is on the on the road to autocracy. I mean, it's not an inevitability. Obviously, he may well lose the election. I suspect he will, um, and even if he wins, you know there are various things that could or could not happen. What what what's the sort of worst case, the, the, a feasible worst case that you, that you worry about? How uh, damaged could democracy be? Well, I think a you know a feasible worst case uh, is that you have a U.S. president who, having served one term uh, and sort of failed to give full institutional force to his tyrannical temperament because he didn't really understand politics that well, has now learned where all the levers of power are and learned what he now has to do to actually dismantle you know, and, and subvert the, the constitution of the U.S. So what happened in 2020 was that essentially 
the US Constitution proved resilient. Uh, and if the person who stood up to that Constitution and tried to undermine it gets back in and knows better how to tunnel underneath it, uh, you then, you know, then the actual constitutional republic is under threat. But also, I think there's this, this wider problem. Uh, and this, the, the thing is where I do feel quite pessimistic about the US is this has all slightly come about because the sort of the information space and the cultural space of American politics is so intensely polarized that you have two almost completely you know, mutually incomprehensible spheres of, of facts that people are operating in. And, and a good example of this is, you know, the, the US economy has actually performed quite well uh, during the, the Biden years, but Republican voters don't think it has. So normally the economy would be <laughs> something you could argue about in the campaign and, and the incumbent could say, hey, look, the economy is doing all right, so, so re-elect me. But if people literally refuse to believe that because it's a democratic economy, not a Republican economy, uh, you're, you're heading towards such a cultural schism in your society that actually politics can't function at all. Uh, and it's not that, you know, I mean, this is a very well-armed society that's very polarized with people who really feel tribally very hostile to each other. And, and you know, I don't want to be too sort of uh, gloomy about it. But I don't see much sign that those civic fibers are being uh, reconnecting so that that can be one political space again anytime soon. Rachel, Britain is is relatively normal. Um, you know. <laughs> Thank your pardon. Well, you know, <laughs> as in democracy itself, you know, is is yeah, yeah. We don't we don't not have endangered. We don't have some guns. We don't have the fireworks. Civil of war. American democracy. Um, you wrote about Sunak's decision to rule out a May election. He was damned if he didn't, damned if he didn't. Either he goes early and loses, or waits and loses, uh, and looks like a bottler. Does it make any difference to Labour when it happens? Uh, yes, in, in a couple of ways. So the main way that it matters to Labour is uh, Labour are terrified of screwing this up. This is the the Ming vase strategy. You're, you're carrying a precious Ming vase across a polished floor and you don't want to do anything to drop it. And Labour are still very, very on edge that something could happen. There could be an issue of party discipline, maybe if, if things get... The situation develops in Israel and Gaza or uh, some scandal comes out and they don't handle it particularly well or mm. events happen. I don't know, Putin invades uh, and Rishi Sunak has the chance to look really prime ministerial or somebody else comes Putin in. Putin invades and, us. But it's, uh, <laughs> I'm saying that there are, there are situations <laughs> right, yes. which make it look different and the longer you wait for an election, the more chance there is that one of these situations could emerge. However, what seems to be happening is the longer Rishi Sunak waits to call an election, the more events work to his detriment. Yeah, because, I mean, things have not been going well for the Tories for some time, I'm going to say. Um, Starmer's top aide, Morgan McSweeney, has been warning against complacency. He's got slideshows illustrating how around the world massive leads have slipped away. Um, nothing that happens in Labour's favour seems to sort of change that. Is it is it possible for Labour to be even more cautious than it has already been? I mean, I think it's good. Has it not hit peak caution yet? I think it's good for a, an opposition party to not be complacent. And that's what that set of slides is about. And I think Labour have had some elections that didn't quite go the way they expected, like Uxbridge and South Ryslip being one of them. Now, we talked at the time about how that was a day in which they overturned this incredible 20,000 majority up in Selby, but they didn't quite manage to take Boris Johnson's old seat by 450, 500 votes. And the narrative became, ah, oh, Labour has failed. Sadiq Khan is bad, climate policies are bad, you know, this is something that the Conservatives can use to fight back, which I think we can all agree, having looked at what's happened since, was the wrong takeaway for the Conservatives uh, to get from that. But I think having those moments where you're like, oh, actually, nothing is certain, there are no election results until people actually vote, sure. is, is probably No, I mean, this is strategy. a true thing, but can you name anybody who actually believes that the Tories could win? Uh, there are some conservatives who I think believe that there is uh, a what's that what, what's that phrase that David Davis used uh, a narrow but clear path to oh God. victory. <laughs> sorry, sorry to bring up David Davis. He is he's sort of the <laughs> the perennial optimist. On the peak caution thing, I think I mean it's possible that. We have passed peak caution, as it were, and there are signs that Labour is starting to sound a bit more confident. I was quite struck by the tone that Keir Starmer used when he was interviewed 
uh, a couple of days ago, a challenged on the 28 billion borrowing, which the Tories are absolutely convinced is the Achilles heel of the Labour project. Yeah, yeah. It goes back to, you know, Labour will spend all your money and they'll borrow and they can't be trusted. And actually, really for the first time, I heard Keir Starmer say, you know what, I'm fed up with you trying to turn this into an albatross around my neck. Yes, we have a policy of borrowing to invest for the future because that's what the country needs. And I'm not sorry about it. And I will argue with you in defense of it. Uh, and so they have, they've retreated a bit. They've diluted it. Yes, it's not exactly the the, the, the pledge that was originally made a couple of years ago, but interest rates were much lower a couple of years ago. And actually, it seems to me that uh, there has been at least a sense of we will retreat this far, but no further. And we're going to actually start making the case for what we want to do in government. I, maybe I'm calling that too early, but uh, I was pleasantly okay. surprised at how punchy he was about that. Actually. I, th- I think there is a difference between being cautious and being anxious or racked by nerves and too tentative and not wanting to say anything because oh, if we say yes to this, then we'll get hammered on this side. And if we say no, we'll get hammered on from that side. You can be quietly confident and also aware that you can't take anyone's votes for granted, which I think is the space that Labour are kind of in at the moment. I wrote about this today about how elections uh, how people sort of decide on an election campaign and there's this old political received wisdom that there are only three types of election slogan. There's uh, let us finish the job if you're in. There's time for change if you're not in. And there's don't let the other lot screw it up, which feels very relevant to right now. Uh, And I think Rishi Sunak's problem was that he tried to do briefly the time for change thing, which is really hard for an incumbent party to do. But that was what his reset was about. Um, You know, I'm being the change candidate at at Tory party conference. Um, It didn't really work. It worked for Boris Johnson in 2019. So that's why he was trying it. It didn't really work. Now he gave his his New Year's speech in his his Q&A session this week. And it was all about, you know, trust us to keep going. Otherwise, we're going back to square one. And I think the problem is that square one looks quite appealing at the moment. And so Labour can be time for change and also don't let the other lot screw it up and both of those messages just because of circumstances are quite compelling uh, I'm going to mention my fun fact here that I discovered from from election research that Keir Starmer will be only the third uh, Labour Prime Minister if he wins which he will um, to use his first name and that we've had three Labour PMs whose first name was James and none of them were James Callaghan I had no idea did you know this? I did not know this right. James J- Gordon Brown James Gordon Brown James Keir Hardy James Harold Wilson and Leonard James Callaghan so there's some weird James action going on. Is there, is there some rule in politics that like if you go into politics and you really want to make it, you, you can't use your first name, obviously thinking of Boris Johnson here? Well, no, because Keir, Keir obviously does that because he's not running as Rodney Starmer. <laughs> uh, if he was, then Rishi Sunak would be laughing. Uh, Marie, let's return to the US. Uh, in March, you are off to the actual US of A um, yes, to woo. report on the election. What's what's your plan? Are you going to be going to diners in the Midwest to hear about how wokeness has failed us? Oh, my God, absolutely not. Now, I will just be checking the internet, but from New York instead of London. <laughs> no, but uh, no. more seriously, I think... Um, yeah, I can hear the sound of commissions being cancelled. <laughs> She's doing what? So I'm, I'm arriving on March 20th, and I think I'm going to start, you know, properly sitting down and thinking about my game plan on around kind of like March 17th, or maybe a bit later. It's quite a long flight, to be honest. Um, but no, I'm, I'm not... Not sure, but I, I am really excited that it is going to be, I mean, an absolutely terrifying election. I think I met the state, so you know that bit in the um, in the IT crowd when Richard Ayoide's character is on his computer and then there's like a fire just in front yeah, of him yeah. and he's kind of like typing, occasionally going, fire, typing, typing, fire. So like the typing for me currently is British politics and then occasionally I glance at US going, fire, but then I'm like, oh no shit, my job is still currently British politics. So yeah, so that, that's where I'm at currently. What do you think Biden's best chances are? He's not terribly popular uh, at the moment. Do you think it will ultimately rest on the economy with the caveat that, <laughs> that Rav said, um, but that enough of that, you're not really trying to reach the, you're not trying to reach the Republican base. You're trying to reach all the other people and they mm. might notice that the economy is actually quite good. Um, the message that democracy is at stake would resonate with a nerd like me. Mm. Do you think that is sort of the thing to get Democrats to the polls? It's like it's, the, you know, it's the coup guy. It's the guy who talks about being a dictator. Uh, so I think weirdly, actually, what we found has worked in the kind of like few elections since the presidential election is that it's mostly I think it mostly 
depends on what the Republicans choose to focus on. Because whenever they actually go really hard on the culture wars, so be that abortion or, you know, transgender issues, etc., they end up losing or not doing as mm. well as they could be. So I think it, it kind of, like in a weird way, I would say that it perhaps doesn't really matter what the Democrats end up campaigning on. It's probably just going to be up to, you know, do the Republicans do the kind of, you know, the, the transes are trying to steal your children and also, you know, anyone suspected who wanted to have an abortion will be sent to jail, which would be very bad for them. But if they pivot to the economy or pivot to something else, uh, then that may be bad for the Dems. This is what makes me wonder, though, because if you pivot to the economy, the economy is like there's only so much you can do with those numbers. You, you mm. might, People might be feeling it's not very good, but you can't really fight an election on the economy is terrible. But isn't it? So I feel like I've read some really interesting stuff that shows that actually weirdly. So the economy, like, the economy is doing really well in the way that, you know, the left kind of traditionally wants it to. It's that meaning that actually it's mostly the lowest paid workers in the US who've had massive pay rises. So, you know, the minimum wage has risen in lots of places, etc. But that does mean that actually for the middle classes in quite a lot of places, life has become more expensive because they're not necessarily earning a ton more. But certainly services are more expensive. That stuff mm. that relies on cheap labor is now more expensive in the US than it was a few years ago, which, again, should be a good thing and especially employed by the left which is why it's occasionally frustrating online to see kind of left-wing commentators going, oh, well, you know, it's like £20 for a burger now. Like, what the fuck, Joe Biden? It's like, no, no, but this is what you wanted because actually the people making your burgers can now afford a home, so that that's a good thing. Classic so burger socialist. <laughs> I think um, there's a big difference between, on that on the point about you know, democracy being in peril, there is, there's a difference between people sort of recognising the sort of Professor Snyder, you know, checklist of re ways in which democracy slides into tyranny and taking getting the sort of abstract theoretical view of the of the constitutional republic unraveling and remembering just how awful and toxic and unpleasant you know america was when all that trump business mm. was going on and i think that will weigh on people so there, there'll be sorts of undecided voters who will they're not massive fans of joe biden they're not the Trump hardcore, but they will be inclined to think, do we really want to go back to all that? Why are we, let, let's not, yeah, they, they will at least remember yeah, the insurrection and the facts around it as, as something not to return to, it even if it's not time. couched in, mm. in, in uh, you know, sort of purest constitutional terms. And that will, I think, help the Democrats. Mm. But yeah, in a weird way, I wonder if Joe Biden may not end up doing what Keir Starmer is trying to do at the moment. So what I found really striking in Keir's New Year's speech was, you know, the bit where he said, we kind of want to recreate a type of politics that treads lightly on people's lives, that like you will no longer have to care all the time. Like populism is an oxygen thief and a time thief, etc. And that that is presumably something the Dems could play on as well, of mm. saying, listen, you've actually probably not had to tune into the news that much in the past few years. And like, wasn't that nice? Wasn't that pleasant? Like, did you actually really miss, as Rafa was saying, you know, having to have Twitter or the news, etc., going, oh, God, what's about to happen next? Just to pick up on what Marie said about uh, Republicans leading on culture war issues, I do think reproductive rights could be very important in this because for sort of decades, Repub uh, Republicans have been chipping away at reproductive rights and generally Democrats haven't been that worked up about it because there's Roe v. Wade. Come on, everyone knows that, yes, some of the southern states might have some abortion restrictions, but everyone knows they won't actually ban abortion. Everyone knows that women won't actually get arrested for having abortions or having miscarriages. Everyone knows that doctors will be able to treat patients who are having miscarriages or have non-viable pregnancies. And what we have seen in the last couple of years since Roe v. Wade was overturned is too horrific for me to be able to go on to, into on this podcast, but you are seeing hospitals in Texas refusing to treat women in life or death situations because they happen to be pregnant. You are seeing women who have other health conditions not being able to get the medication they need because it could pose a risk to a pregnancy that doesn't even exist yet, but were that woman to get pregnant, that medication that she's taking for another condition could interfere with that. You have seen uh, Republicans, Republican legislatures uh, proposing and passing laws that say that if you uh, help someone get an abortion out of state, then that's illegal and lawsuits and all of this stuff and all of the stuff that Democrats couldn't really get that worked up about because everyone knows it's not going to happen. It has happened. And even people who are themselves not particularly pro-abortion kind of recognise that basic medical care for half the population is important and it could be your wife or your daughter or your sister who suddenly needs life-saving care and can't get it because that hospital won't provide it. And I think that 
if the Democrats know how to communicate it, which is something that Democrats haven't been particularly good at historically, but if they can kind of point to the actual travesty that is reproductive care and healthcare in the US, that could be quite powerful. I actually as well. think they they have been good at communicating it in the midterms mm. and in and in various sort of local elections. I think that's the reason why a lot of people have of a lot of Republicans have have lost. Um, abortion, when abortion has been on the ballot specifically, it's always the pro-choice side has always won. And there's clips of Trump going, I overturned Roe v. Wade. Congratulate me on that. And so I, I think that is actually going to be a big component. Mm. I hope so. Um, Raf, what would a second, I mean, second Trump administration would be very bad for America. Um, and it's pretty good for Russia and China, I'd imagine. What do you think it would do for the allies? Do you think that this time there would actually be a kind of a shift in how we we treat America? Almost certainly. And crucially, it would it would be huge for it would be make or break really for the European project. I mean, already the first time, you know, when when you know, Merkel uh, was still a chance in Germany and there was a lot of animosity there from Trump. Uh, he really well, he didn't like women leaders generally, particularly didn't like Angela Merkel. She saw right through him uh, that he was he despised the, the EU uh, partly because he had a very sort of mercantilist and aggressive trade policy. Didn't really understand it, um, but also he threatened you know, to to withdraw from NATO uh, from a longstanding. Actually, it's not just a Trump view, a longstanding American frustration that basically. So sort of Western Europe has been a bit of a free rider on American finance for its security, and it's about time they they paid their way. Uh, and that you know during that first Trump term did prompt a lot of Europeans, uh, led by Macron, to start talking more actively about you know what what Macron calls strategic autonomy. There's different various different ways of framing it, but this sense that actually you know in the 21st century there are going to be power blocks, China. India to an extent, uh, the US, and Europe has to see itself as a sort of self-standing one of those and not just the sort of uh, an economic trade adjunct to American power. Uh, And that will really be forced onto the European project as as an issue in in a second Trump term. And very interestingly, will also then uh, force that question on the UK in terms of strategically, does a, a British prime minister, assuming it's Keir Starmer, even try to maintain the, the traditional posture of the UK as kind of a bridge between Washington and Brussels uh, and you know, its value in the Western alliance being uh, neither one thing nor the other and kind of both. Uh, and that will be very, very difficult. But at the same time, ultimately, you know, if you know, American power is still predominant just in, in military terms yeah, in technological terms as well, it, 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 there's so many awfully difficult moral choices to navigate in a situation where Europe can't just grab autonomy off the shelf, doesn't have the money, doesn't have the infrastructure, doesn't have the guns. Well, talking of moral choices, uh, relations between the West and Russia and China being uh, what they are. India uh, is very, very important. Narendra Modi is an authoritarian populist, practically guaranteed to win uh, a third term. Is this going to be a case of like, don't mention, don't mention human rights? Because India is just too important now. Uh, yes, I, could, I mean I think there's a more complicated uh, answer. To that. <laughs> but but no, Feel free. essentially, I mean going back to, to that point about the sort of yeah, how potentially dramatically and surprisingly quickly geo strategic tectonic plates are shifting. I think there is a strong feeling uh, in certainly a lot of Western governments that you know, China is is sort of unmanageable except as a, a scary rival to be contained. There's a sort of emerging new Cold War dynamic where you have to, you know, I mean, it's, there's a difference between the, the European and the US uh, response to China, um, but it, the, there is a common suspicion and a feeling that, you know, if you've definitely lost any prospect of China being anything other than a big nationalistic authoritarian superpower, maybe the hope for a strategic balance that, that that sort of helps contain China is India being in the camp of, uh, in quotes, you know, democracies, and therefore uh, one mm. of the good guys. And I think uh, there will be a lot of you know, wishful thinking that, that can present India as part of yeah. that side of the equation for fear of driving it to the other side of the equation. 
Marie, Europe! Exclamation mark. Uh, <laughs> Geert Wilder's performance in the Dutch election uh, was a shock uh, a couple of months ago. Um, I saw um, a, um, a clip of an actual fascist rally in Italy with people yeah. really lined up and saluting and so on. Where should we be watching the far right in Europe this year? Uh, I was especially annoyed uh, about Wilders uh, kind of winning unexpectedly because I feel like, because last time he tried, he'd really fallen flat on his ass and that'd been such a delight. Like It was so lovely. It was like, in your fucking face, get Wilders. Uh, bye, see you never. And then it was like, oh no, actually it turns out, see you in a few years, at which point you will actually win surprisingly big. Uh, so that was a bummer. Uh, no, it's, I mean, I, I would say that the country personally worrying me at the moment uh, is actually just Germany. Uh, so the AFD, the Alternative for Deutschland uh, Far Right Party, won its first city mayor election uh, last month. Very exciting in uh, Saxony. Um, and yeah, and it's still uh, currently polling uh, nationally at around 20%, which is very high for the far right. Um, and it's, you know, and kind of like gaining again sort of very local levels, like quite a lot of uh, seats and uh, positions. Uh, it's currently at thirty percent of the polls in uh, the formerly communist East, which is again that's unbelievably hard. Like a third of people want to vote for the far right. Um, um, I believe the far right youth movement as well is making a lot of noise in a way that's really sort of not, not encouraging. Uh, so yeah, no, I, I would say Germany things are not going well, tremendously well. We don't have time to go into the, the details of this because that is a really fascinating story. Uh, Sarah Wagenknecht, who has set up her own party, just called the Sarah Wagenknecht. Party. Party, which is, I want to say good a, for her, but I worry that given the no, 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 it's not wait, in fact good for her. has broken away from Dailinka, uh, mm. the left party, um, and is offering this weird kind of like, well, you know, we're not right wing, we just really don't like immigrants, we like Putin pretty much. Oh. It's populist on that, it's got left wing economics and mm. right wing everything else, and it's just like, oh, okay, right, so even the left is producing this kind of strangely. Um, I don't want to say fascist, but a, but a, but a fairly spooky Populist. Yeah. variant. Well, well Mélenchon like, sort yeah, of yeah. has but a right, apples in that say, kind of stuff as well, doesn't no, it? No, but yeah, this, I, this is an actual split on the left, and it's mm. just become much more obvious rather than being contained mm. in this. Next, like, in France, like we were, I, I feel like they're stealing from us, really. Like we've got a really proud tradition in France of the far left also being massive racists. So, uh, oh, uh, yay! Um, and with the AI deepfakes up and running. How big a role do you think disinformation will play? We've seen a few floating around. Do you think mm. it's going to be one of the big stories of the election year? I, uh, the honest answer is I don't really know, even though I've like interviewed a number of people about it and I've read quite a lot about it. And, and I, I can't quite tell. You know, I, I've seen, and I don't know if uh, the panel uh, have seen, but absolutely terrifying videos uh, of someone, let's say, you know, talking in the way that I am now uh, in front of a mic on video. And it's just not them. They've not said that at all. Like they managed to train. You can now get a software to, I think, listen to it. Like, well, watch a 30 second clip and then you can get that person mm. to say anything. That is horrifying. Um, but, but but equally, you know, so far we've not, A, so far we've not seen much of it. And B, when we had it recently in the UK with a faked audio of Keir Starmer, actually, you know, so many people instantly when that's fake, you know, that should not be shared, etc. So I'm... I want to be cautiously optimistic that maybe it's not that it will happen a bit, but at such a sort of like sl such a low scale that people will be able to fight back instantly. But also at the same time, I am genuinely sort of terrified to the point of like being quite catatonically scared. Um, so yeah, Rachel, I found the research for this segment quite uh, dispiriting. Um, Bangladesh's Sheikh Hasina won a fifth term as PM with no serious opposition. Uh, corrupt former PM Nawaz Sharif may return in Pakistan thanks to the military establishment who ousted Imran Khan and prevented him from running again. Indonesia's frontrunner Prabowo Subianto has a history of human rights abuses back in the 90s. Um, where do you look around? Where do you see a sort of an actual functioning democracy that might return somebody vaguely palatable to our namby-pamby, woke Western ways? So I think to answer that, you've kind of got to go back to what Raf was saying and split the idea of democracy being all about elections and the, this year is the, the year of the elections and the reason we're talking about it is the make or break year for democracy is because half the world is voting and we've got all of these elections and that's a relatively new project in a lot of those countries the last 50, 60, 70 years and what we're kind of getting is that just having the option for people to vote and choose who the government is that doesn't necessarily give you democracy or does it give you democracy or is there something mm -hmm. is there something that democracy is a bit more than that? Does it matter if those people are 
being lied to? Is it really patronising to suggest that somebody who is voting a certain way because that's how they've been told to vote and and they don't have uh, a choice of media or a free press in that country? Uh, Is it patronising to say that maybe that vote, even if it was freely cast doesn't go as much towards the democratic outcome as you would like. And then you get into other questions about institutions. So obviously the media and the courts can, does the the rule of law apply to candidates and former leaders in the same way that it does to anyone else? Thinking about America here. And if it doesn't really apply or if the courts don't have those powers, is that really democracy if some people are treated one way and some people are treated another way? And I think rather than seeing it as a kind of, this is a this is this is, the, this is the year that democracy breaks or whatever. It would be better to see it as this is the year that we kind of realise that it's not all about elections and it's great right. that millions and billions of people are voting, some of them for the first time. Um, but we need a bit more than that. We need civic education. We need strong institutions. We need an independent judiciary. And talking about all of these countries here, including the UK. Um, Less less talk about activist judges and enemies of the people. Less talk about parliaments passing laws that just say that the facts are the way they say they are because they don't like what the courts have decided. Not 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 focusing on any particular country here. Just a just a general comment. And that conversation makes me both optimistic and pessimistic. It's sad that we haven't realised it before, but I think we are starting to have that conversation about how it isn't just about elections now. Is that a cop out? I thought like that's a cop out. <laughs> It, it does but it's, also, really, it's a really important part no, of the conversation. It, it does also remain the case that there isn't an, a coherent, s- sustained model of any other way of doing things, you know, with the exception of of China, which has got a system that, that, that sort of has been quite resilient even to quite serious mm. economic shocks. And no one around the world looks at the Chinese system. I mean, almost no one. Certainly no one in a liberal democracy looks at China and goes, I wish... We had it like that. That's the system we want. So there was sort of the the big picture historical magnetism of liberal democracy as far and away, far and away, the best way to organise a society, the most successful model that has ever existed in the whole of human civilization for delivering both freedom and prosperity and happiness to the greatest number of people. That still stands as a model. So I don't well, think we should. All right, be, Francis you know, Fukuyama. <laughs> we could be. I know, I'm not saying it's <laughs> immortal, but I'm just saying yeah, yeah. it is still much better than the alternatives and Democracy. therefore we can at least be a bit com- bit confident in in trying to sort of advertise its advantages next up it is time to choose our hero and villain of the week uh marie you kick us off uh, yes, mine are going to be quite unoriginal this week, I fear, but um, and, and more quite obvious, not unoriginal. But um, so my heroes are going to be the journalists, especially at Private Eye and Computer Weekly, who actually pursued the post office scandal like week in, week out. Mm. But let's be honest, no one really cared. The national papers weren't covering it. Politicians didn't massively care. But I think it's really, you know, it kind of really shows that um, really dogged reporting uh, works eventually most of the time. So you've got to keep at it. So well done them. And your villain? Uh, and my villain is Denise Coates, uh, who runs Bet365, uh, who's already a billionaire as it stands, but has earned uh, over £270 million in the last year. She's one of the world's biggest ever pay awards. Uh, isn't isn't that great, you know, of, of the backs of uh, people, many of whom actually have betting addictions? Delightful. Rachel? I know you try and vary the topics for this, but I feel like this week it, it is acceptable to have more than one that is post office themed. And uh, I also would have done a shout out for the journalist as well. Um, but I think Alan Bates should be in the House of Lords, no Ooh. question. Um, and I think that we need more people in the House of Lords. One of the reasons for keeping the House of Lords in the first place is to have people like that who are just members of the public who had a cause, have a cause and are really, really Mm. stubborn about it. And we need people like that because there are so many problems and the politicians don't don't solve them uh, and don't even know about them until you get people like that who really take a stand and the the collection of people at the post office for for the villains that the post office itself Paula Venels obviously who we've already discussed but she wasn't even the the head of the post office while the the Horizon scandal was was going on there were a number of other people anyone on the post office's legal team who thought that the private prosecutions uh, so many of them were in anyone's best interests Uh, everyone at Fujitsu I mean just a collection of post office villains is my my one for the week (laughs) 
this this is that like, like, it's like the, yeah. the opposite of an Oscar speech. It's just like no <laughs> thanks to to everyone at Fujitsu, everyone at Horizon, um, Raf. Uh, well, I was going to say uh, Nick Wallace, the, the journalist, uh, one of the journalists who first broke and pursued uh, the Postmaster's story. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that would be unanimity uh, on, on the panel. Uh, but then I suppose uh, thinking of someone else uh, related to my my villain would be uh, Paul Maynard, the uh, pensions minister who is under pressure because he essentially blurred the boundary between the expenses that he was claiming for his constituency office uh, and but using it for party political campaigning as opposed to just sort of local constituency business, which you're supposed to do. And it's a, it's one of those very fine, subtle distinctions, but it's actually incredibly important. I mean, campaign finance, public money in politics, it's so toxic. It's so, it's something that can really, going back to what we were discussing earlier, just undo democracy, uh, undermine confidence in democracy. Uh, and he's been sort of sounded so uh, sort of spiteful and unrepentant about it. Uh, and I just, it, I, that okay. really gets my back up. So maybe my hero would be uh, the uh, con- local Conservative Association member uh, who blew the whistle on him, uh, who, despite also being conservative, thought, hang on, that's not right. Uh, but I don't actually know very much about her, so it's possible she's a villain in some other... <laughs> <laughs> okay, in this respect, or not! In this uh, respect, the, the lawyers would like to make clear, yes. maybe just a great, <laughs> great person. But, but from, uh, from the evidence that I've seen, did a great civic, well, heroic thing. This so is well an easy one to decide, because obviously everybody really wants to say the journalists who cover the post office story for the heroes and the post office in general... Apart from my local mm. depot, lovely people. But the management of the post office will be villains. That's an easy one. Next this week, all is not well in the conservative infosphere. For years now, the right-wing media has been whipping out outrage over statues, taking the knee, the last night of the proms, uh, people of colour on Doctor Who, and other issues that voters don't actually care about, with increasingly apocalyptic fervour. What has this done to the Tory party, and will this hysterical mirror world get better or worse if they get a pasting at the polls? Marie, last time the Tories lost, they did go a little bit mad for a bit. They yeah. certainly went to... to, to for a short amount of time. For a short <laughs> amount. For, for a sh- small number of election cycles, uh, they went a bit mad before deciding to stop being the nasty party, as Theresa May put it, and uh, electing that nice David Cameron, um, who did the job so well. What do you ex- What's he up to these days? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen him for a bit. Um, what do you expect to happen this time? Do you think that this that the Tory party is going to turn into the Telegraph editorial page? So I think I, I've been weirdly standing on a lone hill for some time now saying, actually, I'm not convinced they will go as insane as people predict they are. Um but the more I talk to people, the more I, I, I'm kind of wondering if I should gently kind of walk down that hill again. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like what started convincing me was speaking to two Conservative MPs who are probably likely-ish to keep their seats um, in December. And they were both kind of like grumbling and going, yeah, we have to be nice to Kemi now because she's probably going to be our new leader, uh-huh. uh, which I sort of found bleakly funny. But I was like, oh, God, if, even if you believe that. But, but also I think crucially what that conversation showed me uh, and there's something I've definitely banged on about uh, in this podcast before what I find maddening about especially the centre of the Conservative Party um, is that it has the numbers like it could easily crush the right flank if it wanted mm. to but it doesn't really want to doesn't really have the will and it's kind of um, you know, it, it's, it's a wing of the party that's never seen an Overton window change it didn't like so I think it'll always stick to the centre of the party wherever that centre is so ultimately they're not really a force to be reckoned with so as a result I think you know if the right of the party really wants to go balls out mental after the election then the centre will go oh dear we will have a drinks reception and Damien Green will speak and we'll be very very sad and then we'll do nothing <laughs> Our friend John Elledge uh, wrote a while back for New States mostly Yes uh, the, I edited that I commissioned and edited that piece Well um, I, it was a very good one The right, He said the right wing media have become the Tories bad friends screaming terrible advice in their ears I think the headline was they're heading for a cliff and all they can hear is cheering Do you agree that part of the reason Marie that the Tories have lost their way is that they've just they don't really seem to have anybody on the press going uh, steady on there you might want to tack towards the center etc hmm. oh no absolutely and i think at, at risk of becoming even chummier now i think rachel and nice friend john oxley what i found interesting he's a conservative writer and the reason he got into journalism was essentially by writing this very long essay i think last year going hello I'm a conservative. Obviously, we're fucked. Why is everyone else pretending that we're not fucked? And and that literally launched his career in journalism because everyone was like, oh, wow, there's one conservative who's ready to say this. Um, 
you, you know, so, so, so I do think it's absolutely uh, been a problem. I really enjoyed Harry Cole uh, earlier today tweeting about the mirror being Prafter. And it's like, oh, your beautiful, beautiful glass house, Harry. Um, so, so no, I, I, I think that, you know, if, if you're Conservative MPs and you mostly read the Telegraph and the Mail and uh, whatever else, and you kind of stay in that, that kind of bubble of Twitter and WhatsApp, etc. It is probably easy to convince yourself, not necessarily that, you know, and I don't think anyone believes that the Tories will win the next election massively, but that there's a lot of people going, oh, you know, it's probably going to be a hung parliament or Keir right. will go in on a tiny majority and then he'll do so badly, they will have no choice but have another election in three years' time and then will win again. And you can tell that it's such an obvious result of a kind of like ecosystem them, they're right. all stuck inside because they all say the same thing at any given time. Um, I think I think something else has happened though. There's a, a, actually a quite substantial ideological change that's happened to the Conservative Party. So even when they were being quite bonkers uh, in the sort of late '90s and early noughties, or even earlier, you know, they, they were free to be quite bonkers in in government in in the 1980s. Mm. There was that that part of the Conservative mentality that was ultimately pragmatic and found ideology itself slightly suspicious uh, uh you know because it was a party of government and ultimately your job was to to administer um was was strong and i think post brexit one of the strange things that's happened to the conservative movement generally is it's become actually a little bit more like the far left uh, in having a kind of a utopian bent that is sort of is pr more interested in weeding out heretics and hunting traitors uh, than actually just reaching out to sensible people who might just disagree with it. Uh, and that, that's, that sort of revolutionary radicalism on the right is quite alien to the sort of pre-Brexit conservative would, tradition would, and has cap captured the party quite profoundly. Do people like, whether it's Miriam Cates or Danny Kruger or Matt Goodwin, indeed, um, who claim to be speaking for the people, realise that their views are actually quite unpopular? It's, you know, the, the unpopulism. Do they, do they realise that actually the public does not want what they're selling? It's pretty traditional, certainly if, when you lose an election, the, you know, a normal default response is to first of all blame the voters before you finally get round to deciding to to blame yourselves and the decisions you've made. Uh, and I, I think there's also, I mean, aside from the the Twitter bubbles and, and as Marie was saying, you know, the, the ecosystem, which with the addition of GB News and some other things is now much bigger than it was in the early noughties. So mm -hmm. it's actually, it is much more self-sustaining, albeit not a majority project. You can, it's a much more comfortable, uh, sort of humid ecosystem to support mm -hmm. nuttiness. Um, so, so I think you know, th there is that element of just sort of you, you can get high on your own supply for longer now. Uh, and then there's the other element of it is, of course, these people are getting their supply from the US. And I think there's a failure to understand, particularly from the, you know, I mean, someone like uh, Danny Kruger, who's a very uh, uh, profoundly pious evangelical Christian. Uh, I, I think there's a sort of failure to understand that Britain is a really secular country. There's, they're, they're not, we're not buying some of that stuff that actually plays very well on the, on the American right. I, I completely agree with everything you said, but I think that one other thing I found striking in that kind of line uh, is that I think that entire wing of the Conservative Party now seems to generally dislike voters, you know, but in the same way that, again, normally that's kind of the left of the party. And I think under Corbyn, you did have MPs kind of clearly talking about Britain in a way of going a bit like, oh, come on, you know, please be better voters. Um, and, and I think the Tory strength was always that even when they went mental, they still always kind of respected the electorate. They met the I voters think, where they actually were yeah. rather than where they wished the voters yeah. were. Well, there's, there's a, a genuine dislike for voters and it's a bit like, yeah, that never works for anyone. On they any won't even meet their MPs suspected. where they are because there's loads and loads of pieces about how so and so Chris Skidmore being one is not a real mm. conservative. Well, he's not anymore. Well, he's certainly not a conservative <laughs> now. No, that's factually true. Um, Rachel, um, in America, you've got Fox News right wing personalities like Ben Shapiro, who are huge, very, very influential. Um, now, GB News is not on that scale. But what I wonder with GB News and um, to some extent, you know, the, the Telegraph, I'm not sure about the Mail, is that this traditional role of the right wing press, which is to try and get Tories elected, <laughs> um, is perhaps not so important that for something like GB News, it's just a good business model. And so it doesn't matter if the advice that they're giving to the Tories is electorally destructive because they're, you know, they're making money. And, and that, in fact, is the purpose, that they're not the sort of puppet masters trying to fix the election. They're just trying to make money. I think GB News, there was always a disconnect between 
maybe this is a topic for an entire different show, um, between what various people involved in the project at various points thought it was going to be. Um, some people thought, still think, that there is a space for another news channel that's a little bit to the right and is more interested in local stories and uh, looks at some of the views outside the Westminster bubble. And some people want Fox News for Britain. And those are and some people, in addition to those two things, want even further. They just want the ratings and the more controversial, the better. And uh, outrage clicks, outrage views, mm. you know, count double because people share them more. And those are two, certainly two, almost three quite different models for what you want the news station to be. And I think if you speak to anyone off the record who works at GB News, they will tell you that there's quite a lot of tension between the different people who, who are working there and what they're, what they're trying to do with that channel. But I think... Even without GB News, it's probably more about Twitter and social media in that it used to be the case that if you were a conservative MP, a backbencher, no one was really going to care what you said if you were a minister, sure, but if you were a regular sort of conservative. And if you wanted to be put up on a radio broadcast round or have a column, you had to know the right people, but really you had to wait for the party to be like, yeah, so and so is a good spokesperson mm. on that, ask him. And what social media has done is it enables anyone of any party to say something mad. Uh, immediately it will get traction, it will get picked up by news outlets who go, this person sees. Um, think something mad that's sparking a conversation let's talk to them about it and so one of the best ways to grow your profile as a politician is just to be really extreme on social media and then that gets you attention yeah. and once you get attention then the, the the main part of the party the party management they have to talk to you because you're a brand now and i think that that is basically what's happened with Miriam Cates, for example, I keep seeing Miriam Cates and like I've met her, she's perfectly lovely, but I keep seeing her being described in news articles as senior Tory, Miriam Cates. She mm. came in in 2019, mm. she's got a majority of 7,000, she's almost certainly going to lose her seat. She's never held a ministerial position. She's a conservative who has opinions. There is nothing senior about her except the fact that she has some quite extreme traditionalist views and therefore gets interviewed a lot. Like, that is what makes her senior. And I think that gives other MPs an incentive, a model to follow if you want to get noticed. Well, some of the one, I forget which one it was, but got some attention, including for me, I'm ashamed to say, on Twitter, uh, for sort of complaining about how there are Easter eggs in the supermarkets too early. Jake Berry. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was weird. Which was, a, but, you know, it, it, it got attention. Presumably that's not one of the Tories' top priorities at the moment, delaying the arrival of Easter eggs. What does the British right want? Because when I look at America, it has no programme for governing. It doesn't, like, do, it doesn't really do anything in government. It knows only what it hates. So is there a coherent um, set of demands? Or actually, are you looking at lots of different right-wing people and that Kemi Badenoch might not want what Miriam Cates wants, might not want what Richard Tice wants? Like, is it clear what the kind of their the flags they want to wave are? No, I think one of the things that has definitely happened to the Conservative Party, probably also to the Labour Party in a different way, because there's similar things happening on the left. But the what we think of as the right has split. I'm not going to use that mafia-inspired phrase that got used a lot the last year because my year's resolution not to. But <laughs> safe to say there are different factions within the right mm. who are grouped together as being right-wing Tories who want radically different things. One group, all they really care about is Brexit. One group, all they really care about is tax cuts and cutting regulation and being really free market. And they'll think that that's the way to get growth and we don't really care what you do in your bedroom or who you marry or what you think of statutes. Use. And the important thing is that, you know, you go to work, you're a productive member of society, you don't have to pay that many taxes, boom, job done. One group actually are quite okay with taxes being relatively high to fund things like the NHS and public services. And they don't want everyone out to work because really half the population, they never really say which half, but you know, we all know, half the population should be at home having babies. Well, there's certainly more babies for the fatherland contingent. That's kind of very, very different to the Liz Truss yeah. free market lot who say like, no, if you are an educated woman who has very high earning potential, of course you should be out there having a job and somebody else should be looking after your kids or maybe don't have kids. It's totally up to you. So it's the question that the Tories will go move to the right, but we don't know which right. Yeah, think... that, that failure of the Liz Truss government was so important because they that was the point at which 
the, uh, yeah, a, an important section of the Conservative Party got literally everything they'd wanted. I mean, they, they basically, they just got to do, they were given the keys to the sweet shop and said, you know, just go nuts uh, and it ended badly and conceptually it was it was such a sort of an ex, should have been such an extinction level event for a whole set of ideological propositions but of course that was impossible to swallow um and so yes you have but yeah i, I think rachel's absolutely right right this essentially there is there's nationalism and there's libertarianism of uh, both sort of quite utopian projects in terms of saying here is a here is a, a set an agenda that if you apply it all, uh, everything works perfectly. And they are mutually uh, sort of exclusive. They're incompatible as doctrines, uh, except as complaints about a more kind of centrist, liberal, moderate, progressive proposition. Mm. And so they are much happier in opposition, uh, which is why they're heading there at great speed. <laughs> well, um, I want to wrap up this section. I've asked everybody to bring in uh, a headline which tells you where the where conservatism's head is at. Um, I use host's prerogative to steal the obvious one, <laughs> the doomsday preacher to outdo them all, Alistair Heath at The Telegraph. And I just picked his latest one at random and just, <laughs> and just thought, oh, I wonder what he's saying now. Western civilization is being destroyed from within by forces we can't control. The horrifying truth about woke ideology has finally been revealed. It gives open support to genocide. Uh, it's, it's got... <laughs> It's got the, the death of civilization, horrifying truth, ideology, bad, except if it's his ideology, uh, genocide. Like, it's, it's got everything. Probably Ev bad. Every single one, every single Alistair Heath column, if you just look down the headlines, is like just this sort of screaming. You literally use like, we are on the edge of the abyss. Uh, everything is going to be destroyed. For, except for the piece he wrote after the, the quasi quartet mini budget. Yeah. He said, this is absolutely the best thing that's ever happened. I'm so happy. I've, I've never seen a more perfect budget, which is exactly the point about I, I, how once I, that's I, happened, you know, and once, once the cults, once the, you know, yeah, your. Yeah. The, the, the aliens haven't abducted you and you haven't had the rapture, yeah. uh, where do you go? <laughs> I, well, I, I, I call where his, his, his strand is apocalyptic conservatism. And he is the um, he is the top preacher, Rachel. I've gone for a really prosaic one, uh, but you know it's relevant. Does it not mention the end of the world? <laughs> it, it, it it doesn't. It's just about Rishi Sunak's speech uh, today, and it's the Daily Mail's leader, and so it doesn't even have an author. It's the it's it, it's just the publication, and the headline is "A Brighter Future Only the Tories Can Deliver," and it's not clear because it's not in quote marks whether that's the Daily Mail's view or something Rishi Sunak has said. It looks certainly like it's the the Daily Mail's view. And it it starts off that with a powerful article in today's Daily Mail, Rishi Sunak effectively fires the starting pistol for the election campaign and how markedly different is his uplifting message compared to Sir Keir Starmer's preposterously doleful New Year address. Like, I watched the speech. Like, that, there's no resemblance to reality. I'm not saying that Keir Starmer's one was, was great either, but it wasn't doleful it was actually quite uh, there was it was, it was criticized uh, in other quarters on the right for for being too optimistic um but it's just the idea that rishi sunak is somehow the tory savior and you see that in leaders a lot like a complete i was gonna say inability but it's not an inability because they could do it just no desire at all to criticize somebody who is very obviously flawed presumably because they think he can't handle it, that he is so fragile mm. that even a bit of criticism would shatter him, which is in itself quite damning. And true. Uh, Marie? Uh, so I've got, and I feel like I, I want to start by saying it was really unfair that you got to pick Alistair Heath and start with it, because by comparison, all of us will actually be a bit like, yeah, I've got one, it's fine. Yeah, he um, is the, he's, yeah. The, he's the Beatles of lunatic conservatives. <laughs> I, I, I must have mentioned this on the podcast before, but if not, or for new listeners, uh, you may enjoy the fact that, so I used to work at the Telegraph, uh, and even back then, like a decade ago, uh, some friends used to, well, like when he was in the canteen, they used to walk behind him talking loudly about how much they love paying their taxes, and I would physically follow him around the newsroom talking about loving taxes, um, which I really enjoyed. Um, but no, so I picked uh, in the Sun, Rod Liddell, uh, the, the kind of end of year column saying, neither Tories or Labour represent what Brits really want, really in all caps, control immigration, equal society and an end to wokery. And I just don't get it. I stared at that headline for quite a long time because it's a bit like an equal society is... Surely that's woke. Like that's the wokest thing you can possibly have. It's, like, it's Marxist. It, yeah, but no, exactly. So how? So how? So you're fighting the woke by wanting everyone to be equal. I, I don't really understand. And I'll even control immigration. I'm a bit like, and th th that's slightly more nitpicky. 
But, you know, if you're kind of choosing to grade immigrants in some way, is that really equal society well, of well, you? But, but, but also, this is an interesting thing about polling. When you go back to, like, mm. the, the, these these figures say that they represent, you know, the, the vast silent majority, is that, yes, if you poll people on do they think immigration is too high, I think a majority say yes. If you poll them on <laughs> would you like there to be fewer foreign workers in the NHS, mm. fruit pickers, in social care, f- fewer foreign students given that these are the fees that they pay, do you think that it was wrong to give uh, a, a route to, to, to come here to people mm. from Hong Kong or, or Ukraine, Afghanistan, people overwhelmingly say, no, no, we, we, we like those things. So the public are not consistent. And one yeah. of the problems that the Conservatives are having and Labour will have it as well is, is dealing with all those discrepancies. But it's not enough to say nobody is offering what the public want because what the public want is impossible. Well, perhaps hmm. my only asset as a commentator is a real full understanding that what I want is not, in fact, what the people want. You're not, <laughs> are you not a person? There are certain the people over there, capital mm. P, I'm just a little person. Um, but there are certain things that I would like that I know full well are not particularly... Um, oh, f- a full legal regulated market for all controlled drugs. That's what oh, I want. Right. Nice, nice. Yeah, but for example, yeah. you know, I don't go, I'm speaking for the people and they want like full drug legislation and the, you know, the abolition of, uh, you know, private schools and, you know, high taxes on this and on the wealthy and so on. I mean, they probably do want that as long as they're not the wealth. Mm. Um, but, you know, there are certain things that I just f- I'm fully aware are not what the people want. But that there's a style of commentator. And mm. that's where I wonder about your Danny Kruger or whatever. It's like I want to say to him, you do realize that this is a you're very niche that most people are not evangelical Christians with mm. extreme con- cultural conservative views. You do know that this is not the people and that therefore you're never really going to get what you want. I know that I'm not going to get what I want, but mm. I might get a bit of it. Um, but I wonder as well, actually, if that's also partly a problem where they'll go back to their constituencies and be like, well, you know, in my constituency, people say X, Y and Z. And it's like, yeah, you probably talk to conservative members <laughs> and like there are only seven of them left nationally and they are very weird, all of them. So it's not even so. I wonder if there's a psychological thing as well of going, well, away from Westminster, you know, I went back to, you know, my seat and that's what they said. And it's like, yeah, they're not normal either. If you're talking to the members of your association, these are not normal people. And, and also that people outside of London are real people, but anyone who lives in London oh, yeah. is not a, <laughs> not real, a real person, person, even though millions of Londoners do exist and, and do vote, but somehow their votes are worth slightly less because they're London voters. I, li- I live in London and I'm woke and I work in the media, so I'm like not a real person at all. I barely exist <laughs> politically. Um, Raf. Your headline. Um, well, yeah, um, unsurprisingly, there is a woke element to this too, but this time it's the NHS that's woke, according Ooh, to GB no. News. Ooh. So Woke NHS asks patients to choose from 12 genders and if they are, in quotes, goddess, satanist or druid. Um, (laughs) And I saw that story on the GB News website uh, and and surmised that it might not be true, uh, or at least not not in the way that the headline suggested Mm. is. And, And sure enough, I mean, there's a sort of outsourced software thing application that when you register for certain services, you get a drop down menu of options and... Yeah, look, I actually, yeah, I think there is probably an element of the the this where quite a lot of people do think it's a bit weird that I have to that there's a, I have an option of twelve or more things for my gender identity. This is this baffles me. You know, I think a lot of people, yeah, that that is probably quite a mainstream response to that stuff. But it's also nowhere near the single biggest issue facing the NHS or something people think about when they think what are problems currently facing the NHS. So in, I think there's a different element to this. It's not just sort of m- making things up. It's just sort of zeroing in on parts of the political pitch that are so peripheral to exactly as you were saying a moment ago what mm. you know most people would understand to be their priorities and and that's where the right will find itself uh, actually quite marginal we've reached the end of the show uh, so it's time for, quickly for our escape routes uh, fun things that are not politics uh, marie uh, so really randomly, I watched um, I Heart Huckabee's uh, Yesterday Night, the comedy from 2004. And it is so weird in kind of a good way. Like It's basically a wacky comedy about existentialism. Uh, it's got an amazing cast. Um, you know, so like um, Young Jude Law, Jason Schwartzman, uh, Isabelle Huppert, etc. Just really, really puzzling, unique movie, but incredibly fun. Like a, a sex scene that made me laugh out loud. Massive flop, but kind of a cult favourite. Really? Oh, yeah. People hated it. But now it is beloved. But it's so fun. Yeah. Rachel. 
Uh, somebody has to say the traitors, right? The traitors is back. I've never seen the traitors. The, tra- the traitors is back. So I really like reality TV, but not like not trashy reality TV. The tra- traitors are quite trashy. Not the kind where like everyone is horrible to each other for the sake of it, and they're all trying to launch like influencer mm. careers. The kind where like something vaguely that engages some part of my brain but like not most of it because I'm trying to escape mm. and The Traitors is 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 all of that the psychology of it is fascinating the kind of group dynamics and you genuinely have no idea from minute mm. to minute how, how things are going to work out and, and, and how it could all turn and the last series was breathtaking and this series is already shaping up to be breathtaking Superb, Raf. Uh, am I allowed to say that I went to a fantastic gig on Friday and really enjoyed the live music experience um, in the entirely narcissistic vein, self-serving ground? Were you playing? I was on stage <laughs> <laughs> incredibly badly, but having a lot of fun. Oh, uh, so, but essentially, basically making music, singing, dancing, making a tit of yourself is uh, generally almost exclusively and uniquely and reliably a good way to spend a Friday evening and not think about politics. The Music of My Heart by Raphael Baer is available on Spotify. Um, mine is Fargo, which is my favourite TV show of the past decade or so. And the new series is an absolute banger. Possibly the best or at least the most sort of, I think, flawless. Um, and it stars John Hamm. Best role since Mad Men and Juno Temple and Jennifer Jason Lee and a bunch of less well known but brilliant people. And it's actually got it's got all the best bits of Fargo, which is sort of this merger of the film Fargo and the Cohen Brothers film No Country for Old Men and other parts of the Cohen verse. Uh, but it really drills into sort of gendered violence and control and power dynamics in families. And it's just absolutely flawless and genuinely had bits that made me like elevate off the sofa with sort of admiration for the the risks it takes uh so watch that it's on amazon prime as are all the other previous seasons and they're all amazing and that is the end of the tuesday edition of oh god what now thank you so much raf thank you for having me marie thank you and rachel thank you oh god what now we'll be back on thursday for our backers and friday morning for everyone else thank you for listening see you next time